Yeah, shall we try to shall we start? Yeah, give it a go. Uh, here. Short on time, so. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Is the sound on? I think so. Welcome to, to PIM. We've got a very full agenda, so we're going to try to start right on time here. Um, hope you all seen the note well. Um, can you try it? Next slide. Yeah, so the note well. Hopefully, you're all aware of that. Um, it's the same as usual. Uh, okay, then the agenda. Um, any comments on the agenda? It's very full, at least. Um, if there's no comments, let's move on. So I'll quickly go through the working group status. So we published three new RFCs since last meeting. That's pretty good. We've never done that before, I think. Um, and um, then we got three, three um, BIS documents. So it's the IGMP version, the MLD version 2, and um, ah, what's it called? The host, uh, whatever, multicast. Anyway, those, those three documents. No, no, sorry, some IANA consideration, IANA updates. But those three documents, we did a last call on them before, and we didn't get any comments. So we want to do a new working group last call after this meeting, and we really want some of you to review them. Like we're moving IGMP version 2, sorry, version 3 and MLD version 2 to internet standards. So it's kind of important work, and uh, we really want it to be correct. And So um, please help us and respond to the working group last call. Uh, yeah, we really want to get those documents published. Apart from that, we got these DR documents that we need to figure out what to do with sometime. Not discussing them today. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think AI was on me. I'll be updating these two drafts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. And then we got um, point to point, point to multi point policy that we're not discussing today. Um, I think the work is pretty much done. Um, so hopefully that can go to last call soonish. We've got the policy ping that we'll discuss today, PIM light we'll discuss today. There's this Lisp extensions draft. I'm one of the co-authors. We need to do more work on that. Um, and then some more documents not discussed this meeting. But yeah, we have a lot of working group documents as you can see. Next slide. Quick comment on the lessons learned. We were going to present it this time, but there's not enough time. So there has been a fair amount of uh, new text into that draft on MOSPF and MSDP. So please read it. It's going to be a draft that we'll be working on for some time, um, but we want to make it as useful as possible. So please review it. Yeah, I think there's some people that have said they have might have some text or some contributions to it. All right, and then um, we adopted five new documents just the last few weeks um, or last month or two. Um, so this is the host, uh, whatever it's called. Um, Twilis can help me, but no, it's the host. Um, it's basically explaining the multi yeah IP multicast host stack. So as part of revising. Uh, the uh, you know with two with IGMP and MLD RFCs and so on. We also want to revise this one to be up to date. And then they got the um, different drafts on the um, auto configuration and stuff that we have been discussing the last couple of meetings that we also adopted. Okay, any questions or comments before we move on to the presentations? All right, let's get going, I think, with the first presentation. Um, okay, so the PIM light, uh, I did some modification based on the last IETF. N next slide, please. So, um, 
couple of things I changed. Uh, there was a comment that when it comes to the PIM SM, uh, there is no concerns with the DR and the RP being in the same uh, uh, PIM light domain. So I, I removed that text. Uh, when it came to the PIM assert, uh, obviously, uh, since there is no hello, they cannot uh, negotiate the assert and figure out whether there is duplicate traffic coming from the upstream. So I did put some text in there that kind of explains that from network design point of view, uh, the operator should kind of make sure that uh, there is not duplicate traffic coming from the upstream. With the same token, I did also uh, did the example in there uh, because this draft was really created when we wanted to do PIM over beer, PIM tunneling over beer. So I did put a couple of texts in there that when it comes to PIM tunneling over beer, um, when you try to figure out the uh, the beer edge router that is closer to the source. And if you figure out that there are two beer edge router, then you can actually choose only one of them based on the some kind of IP character, you have highest IP or lowest IP. Anyway, I guess the long story short, what I put in the draft right now is that this is really implementation kind of thing. And uh, here are our recommendation. Um, and when it comes to the vendor, they need to implement it accordingly. Um, next. So the next one, which was the RFC 6559, which is the PIM over reliable transport. That one was a fun one. I uh, used my imagination. Uh, so apparently right now, when it comes to the TCP, you use the, the hello message to actually uh, send the TCP because I guess the destination of the hello message is multicast. So somehow you need to figure out what is the destination TCP port as well. So you need to put that TCP destination port in the hello message or something like that. The hellos are just multicast uh, uh, PIM, PIM messages, just then the joint prunes there, uh, TCP unicast. Okay, all right, yeah, yeah. So basically, there is this thing called the peer connection ID that needs to be set up through the hello message. And again, uh, we need to talk about this. What I put down in the draft for now is that since there is no hello message, all this uh, information, they need to be configured manually under the PIM light. I, I, I don't know if the working group agrees on that or not, but I mean, I couldn't think of any other way of doing this. So you just go under interface and you just say that here's the connection ID on this side, you go on the other side, you configure the connection ID too, and off you go uh, with, the, with the reliable transport. And if TCP doesn't come up, I said uh, in the draft, go back to UDP. Uh, those are all the changes I made. Um, any comments, any thing that you folks, uh, next slide, sorry. Yeah, so that's where we are right now. Um, comments, questions, what do we need to do next? Uh, yeah, uh, Stig here, I, I think I have, I need to go carefully through it, but I think I have probably some, some input and no, I I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I guess I'm a co-author too, so I <laughs> should <laughs> contribute. Thank you for yeah. coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah I appreciate yeah, that. Thank yeah. you. Sunny Zhang ZT, we just uh, started our work on the DFB election in BR working group. So maybe uh, in PIM, you can use it also. Yeah. And that's okay. our algorithm to elect the DF for multiple uh, source will advertise the, uh, will send the same multicast flow. flow. So, so it's a DF election in the beer overlay. So maybe PIM Light can use the algorithm also, but it's just a reference. For it. Okay, but there's some kind of signaling for the, for the selection. Like I, I haven't read that draft to be honest with you. On, on the beer side, there's some kind of signaling, I guess. Okay, we will talk. Uh, talk at, uh, about it in the Friday meeting, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just, I, I guess one thing we need to keep in mind is that when we wanted to do PIM light, we wanted to keep it very, very basic, right? Okay. So that's, that's the only caution I'm giving out there that, you know, 
yes, we can completely start reinventing the wheel and coming up with all these new packets that go back and forth to figure out assert and DR and all this other stuff. But that takes the way that then might as well use PIM, right? I mean, that, that's why we wanted to do the PIM light to get rid of all this stuff. Just a caution. Just Let's not make option. it more complicated yeah. than it is. Uh, you can just add a reference in your draft to provide another opinion for the um, providers to select the algorithm. So it's just an uh, informal team okay. reference. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's Greg, me. Um, the solution tends to track the complexity of the deployments. So I'd say, like, I had this explained to me at lunch, which is great. Well, you got PIM on the other edge, PIM's already around the box. It makes sense to even pit for messaging across the other side. So I'd say the, the uh, generic DF election mechanism is really targeted for those PIM free environments. We talked like data centers where you know, hosts are actually sourcing things like this, where mm. there is no PIM. So we're kind of stuck having to do both. Mm. And I think maybe even explaining in the documents what the deployment model would be, you know, what's the motivation for doing this, mm. so people can kind of track their way along. I mean, that that's good point. The deployment that I know for sure is the beer. Um, there were some other ideas that we can use this in other type of uh, deployments, which I guess, well, I think it was you yourself, right? Let's see. Um, yeah, maybe. But yeah, at least I would say, I don't think should talk much about beer in this, this document at all. Okay. Uh, there's other use cases oh. too for doing PIM without okay. uh, hellos and stuff. Sorry, I forgot where um, I was. And then in the beer, in the beer, right, there is this document for, for how to do PIM overlay. And there, I think it's good to have the motivation about, okay. about deployment models and way it's like, a, yeah, what are the good use cases? Okay, so yeah, maybe we should get together and yeah. you know, clean yeah. it up. Yeah. Yeah. All right, appreciate. It. Okay, thank you. I think that's it on this one. If there is no other comments, question. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so I'm just going to give a little bit of update what's happening in the point to multi point policy. Um, so, the replication segment draft, we added SRV6 to it for the past couple of releases, uh, versions. Uh, and uh, so now it includes SRV6. Uh, there will be implementation of the SRV6 pretty soon, but that uh, draft which was the, the mother draft for this entire work. Uh, I believe it's going for RFC now. Uh, they did the last call on it. There were some security concerns in there on the security section, but I think everything went smoothly and it's going for the RFC. Uh, so when that one comes out as an RFC, uh, the next one would be the point to multi-point policy. So again, to refresh everybody's memory, the replication segment was the multicast state for the tree seed and then the policy is the head end policy that you can actually use it as a PIMZ uh, against the next generation MVPN or whatever you want to use it against. Um, so that one is in this working group. I think we added some kind of SRV6 uh, text against it as well. Uh, we need to talk to the authors, but I think it's in a good shape and we're probably going to do a last call soon. The next one is the Yang. I need to kind of revive that. Uh, obviously, this technology is the controller type of technology. So the Yang is really not uh, something important, but it would be nice to have a Yang for CLI. So I'll, I will revive that. And I think there was a conversation whether this should come into PIM or it should stay in the spring. I'm not sure what we decided, but I mean, we need to talk about that. Um, the next one is the overlay. Uh, just how we're going to signal the overlay for MVPN. Uh, that work is in progress too. Uh, I think it's in a good shape as there are implementation of this tree seed with next generation MVPN out there. Um, the la next one is the PCE. As I kind of mentioned, this technology is uh, controller driven, meaning that uh, on the route, you try to figure out where the leaves are and you feed all that information to the controller. And then the controller tries to nail down other rep uh, replication points um, into, the, into the data pad. The beauty of it, I guess, is the fact that it kind of marries 
unicast and multicast. Uh, your replication points, they don't need to be back to back. They could be connected via a unicast SRV6 or segment routing kind of domain, which is attractive to some of the vendors out there. Uh, so yeah, we are working on the PCE part of it. Uh, Again, we are trying to implement it multiple vendors and, and it should go forward. Um, so the IDR, uh, obviously there's one way of downloading these replication segments from the controller to the, to the routers via PCE, uh, PSAP, but there's another way of doing it via BGP. Uh, the next step after we are done with the PCE would be BGP SR point to multi point policies to download these uh, replication points. Um, and last but not least is some kind of OEM. Uh, I think one thing we need to be very careful about is the point to multiple policy ping is only for MPLS. It was not covering SRV6. Uh, we did that just to make sure that it's a simple pill to swallow because we were following the LDP and the RSVPT OEM and stuff. So we just wanted to, you know, uh, make sure this goes through the working group very quickly and we can have a, a standard OEM way of pinging all these leaves. Uh, that's why we just focused on OEM, uh, sorry, on MPLS. Uh, the, re the point to multipoint policy draft, the, the PIM SR point to multipoint policy draft, that has some text for SRV6 OEM. Um, I, next slide, please. There's a question. Yeah, Jim? sure. So Jim Gishard, uh, just a um, for your information, the uh, replication segment. I just finished that. It's in the RFC editor queue. Oh, wonderful. so we're all Thank done you. on that. And I have the scars. I must <laughs> say, we had four discusses on that document. Yeah, great. but no. I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And that draft is one that we're very dependent upon as far as progressing our related draft, yeah. the policy draft. We've always been pointing to that replication segment draft. The reason you added SRV6 to the R draft is because it was added to the spring draft. Is that yes. correct? That's correct, yes. And is that significant text? I mean, is it a page? Well, it, uh, it does explain how the SRH uh, should be built uh, and, you know, uh, the, the um, the way that the SRH should be manipulated on the PHP routers. And yeah, there are some texts in there. So we as a working group really need to review that, the, the PIM draft, because SRV6 has been added to that. Well, most of that, the heart of it is in the replication segment. Uh, but yeah, there are some examples of the SRV6, which it's fun. Okay, very good. Okay. Okay, so when it comes to the MPLS OEM, uh, MPLS in cap, again, we kind of followed the, uh, the wheel that was already there for uh, LDP and RSVPTE. We assigned a, a candidate path uh, through I, uh, INAA for a specifically point to multiple point policy. And uh, from security perspective, I'm just pointing it back to the RFC AD29 because Literally, it's the same implementation, and all we did here is we added a brand new sub TLV for the Canada path, MPLS Canada path, and that was it. That was all. Um, next slide, please. Um, I guess one thing that I missed in the previous slide is that there is an implementation in there, and I put that in the RFC too. Uh, uh, we actually implemented it. I don't know whether Cisco did or not, but anyway, there is implementation. And last time, uh, I did send an email to the MPLS working group to see if they have any comments. Nothing came out of it. So I think maybe a last call would be in order to get people to add comments or whatever that they need to do. That's all. OK. So you're asking for a last call for this draft? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, uh, since I tried a couple of times to get some comments to see what's going on. Um, no, but I haven't heard anything whatsoever. So I kind of find it hard to believe that nobody has any comments. Yeah. So should we do that on the list then maybe? <laughs> <laughs> that never happens. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we need to get better at you know, giving input and 
more discussion on the mailing list and so on. But mm-hmm. unfo- unfortunately, yeah, everybody's need- busy. But I know we need to do a last call, mm-hmm. I think, to get more input. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'll take it to the list. Yeah. All right. Uh, Dino has, has made this happen. Okay, so I'm gonna give two presentations. First one on GAP and give you a demo on how we got it to work over IPv6. Uh, this presentation is gonna bring up two issues that came up on the mailing list, mostly the stuff that Torlis brought up. And then we're gonna give a presentation on IPv6 multicast application over LISP um, over Starlink satellite networks. We were gonna do that in the LISP working group, but we ran out of time. So we pointed those people to come here. Okay, next. Okay, what is GAP? Just briefly, it's a decentralized multicast group address allocation protocol. That means there's no central entity that allocates group addresses. The group addresses are allocated through a library that GAP runs in the application and creates a unique group address across all the GAP speakers. And uh, no configuration, that's it. Okay, the draft status is, I can't read it. Okay, so we just made it, uh, it became an individual, I can't read it. In November of 2022, we started it, I guess that was last fall, and we just made it a working group document. Thank you for supporting it. Next. So two issues were raised on the list. The first thing was, how should GAP apps use multiple address families? And should GAP allocate addresses out of an ASM range or an SSM range? So we'll go through each one of those. So GAP apps are basically allocated to um, group addresses when they call the library routine GAP allocate. Um, They get the two group addresses they get as an IPv4 group address. That's unique and an IPv6 address. And so what receivers could do is they should join one, should they join one or the other AF group? Should they join both? Should they coordinate out a band and decide which one they want to talk on? Okay. So in my implementation of this uh, app that I built called GapChat, I'll tell you which one I decided to do. On the sender side, should the sender send to one or the other AF groups? like Happy Eyeballs does for TCP connections, or should they send to either one or the others, or should they send to both? Probably don't want to send to both because it doubles the bandwidth, Um, but you have to know what the receivers are doing. If partial of the receivers are joining on an IPv4 group and partial are sending on IPv6 group, you have a problem here. Okay, so what should we do? Uh, We we still desire that these are decentralized apps, so we we want all the uh, coordination to be in-band and not out-of-band. Next. So, so I, I believe that, um, um, that this is not very much an issue that we have to decide in the gap spec. It's really how the applications want to run. And I have a resolution through the implementation. So we'll talk about that. So um, the coordination with the network is even more complicated if we try to get um, V4 receivers and V6 receivers. Um, If you look at RFC 6831 to support overlays, that's LISP multicast overlays on either a unicast or or multicast underlay, there's over 500 combinations that can occur. And that means there's a receiver that's on the overlay that's V4, a receiver that's on an overlay or not on an overlay that's on V6. There's senders that are attached to multicast or non-multicast. If you look at every single combination, that RFC bring, uh, puts it out to 500 combinations. So it's totally crazy because um, multicast is hard. It's multi-recipient. So do we choose an IPv4 or IPv6 underlay? That, might, uh, um, that may not be native to all members. Do we choose IPv6? Um, do we choose IPv6 underlay? There may not be all native members. All these sort of issues come up. So this is really hard. Actually, 
Overlays make it simple because the mapping system can tell you how people are reached. And if they think at the edges they can't get native multicast, then you can give them, put unicast R loops in the mapping system. More later on that. Next. Okay, so th this is probably a contentious group. So what GAP does is allocating group addresses to the application and the application decides on the port number and doesn't um, do anything with sources. Um, we're, we want to support the multicast service model, which means we want TTL expanding ring search. We want auto discovery of sources and participants. We want all this stuff to, to happen for the application. So um, it doesn't do any um, source discovery. So one would argue that this employs an ASM model um, for any multicast protocol native or overlay. Um, so an app can do whatever it wants. As a source, the app doesn't care about the multicast service model. It can just send and then something happens somewhere else to make it SSM. As a receiver, the app could decide um, via IGMP if it wants to just join a star comma G versus an S comma G. These are all the sort of same sort of problems we have today. So I don't think we need to bring this complexity into GAP because GAP is trying to provide a, any ASM um, service model. So my conclusion is, is that we, I do not want to put subranges into GAP. I just want to allocate groups. And those groups that are being allocated um, can be coordinated with the network, but it's not going to be easy to do for us. Yeah, so I, I'm 100% persuaded that this simply needs to support ASM and SSM, that we simply split the, ad, split the address range into both of them. And um, it's it, what, what you're writing there is a source. The app doesn't care about a multicast service model. That's not true. When you are a source for an SSM uh, address, then basically you need to make sure that the application has a way for the receiver to know what the source address is. That's an application responsibility. That's fine. We also solve this application responsibility in, for example, the Garmin use cases already. So um, seriously, it's, it's, it's very simple. You, you were asking first, right? So we split the address range. There is an ASM address range. There is an SSM address range. In GAP, it's, it's in the API, simple. you're simply asking, give me an ASM address or give me an SSM address. How and, does and the that... application know what ranges the network is using? So how does it know which one to allocate? I don't... No, that's what, what you're doing, right? So if we, we have the second draft, right, which is this uh, IANA registry from which we're going to take an address range or two address ranges for, for GAP, right? That is the second one from, from Carson. No, so, the, GAP, the GAP spec says it's going to get a single range for IPv4 and, and for IPv6. And the GAP spec needs to say it gets a range for ASM, it gets a range for SSM. Done. And Second. how does the application know which range to allocate it? It's going to ask GAP for no, no. a group address. You're basically, the allocation, as you said, needs to know whether it wants to be ASM or SSM. In the case of the Garmin application, for example, it's clear that these are um, SSM applications. So they're basically saying, I want to have an SSM address. Done. It's not, no, it's not that simple. The application doesn't know about any of the sources. No, and you're does. requiring it, it to do In that. the Garmin application, it does. No, they have their own. That's, a, that's an application that will not use GAP. No, that's not true. Us, us, us <laughs> I'm telling you it's not true because this protocol doesn't support it. No, wait a second. If if if, <laughs> if you if you have your way with GAP, that's true. But if we if, if this is a working group document, as a working group member, my opinion is it's it's darn simple to simply have GAP support ASM and SSM. But we want to support Torless, we want to support decentralized applications. Yes. So how how are the all the applications, all the members of the group and senders of the group going to decide on either SSM and ASM and also coordinate with what the network is using you for write the ranges? The application SSS and SSM application. We want applications to work without knowing sources. No, that's why? Why? Be, this because this, that's this, the service model we no, want the, the no, allocation protocol. No, that is what protocol. you think GAP should do, but the use case from Garmin was always that the sources are well known. We're not um, building a protocol for one use case. No, we're trying no, to make but a general. We're, we're building a protocol for some use cases. And you can perfectly well use GAP for ASM if you think uh, there, there should be ASM applications. But there are just people like me and hopefully other in the working group that are saying there should be support for SSM applications. And they will perfectly well work if you're just agreeing to basically allow that GAP can allocate out of two ranges, an ASM range and you, an SSM range. You want to give it more That's functionality it. in the definition of the protocol is that it's an ASM protocol, period. 
No, it's no, not, no, wait a second. It's, it's not trying it, to add it, more. You want to add it, more it, functionality. It, 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 it is darn simple for it to allow allocation out of two address ranges, an ASM address range and SSM address range. We can allocate these ranges through the other draft, which is from Carson, which is for uh, which, which ranges we're doing what with. So this is, this is darn simple what I'm asking for. So I'm not sure what the resistance is other than you don't like SSM and you don't want to see SSM deployed. So and that's just what I'm saying we should- Not for these flavor of applications. No, no, wait right. a second. Uh, these, who, yeah, what, what are the these way, flavor uh, of applications? Nate has Sorry, but too. It, I think we're running yeah. out of time. Nate is like you, we should ask, check what he says, I think. Yeah, can you do it? Or should that, oh no, I did. Okay. Uh, Nate, uh, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to point out that we, we do not want to use SSM. Uh, the, the model makes it seem like it's SSM, but we're actually wanting to use ASM just because our hardware does not support SSM. <laughs> that, yes, there, there, there is no difference between ASM or SSM for your layer two switches. That doesn't, that doesn't matter at that point in time. I'm on this draft, so I shouldn't be speaking as a chair, so I'm not, but uh, we'll ask the list to see if you're, if the only voice that shares that opinion. Let's keep going. I certainly will have to think more about this myself. And, yeah, but yeah, we should take it to the list. Okay, so um, at last IETF, we showed a, an application called GapChat. And what we did was we used GAP to allocate an IPv4 group address, and we sent messages on it. GAP chat is just a text-based um, uh, pr program that sends messages to a multicast group. It has a ping functionality where it can send a ping message to the multicast group, and all the GAP chat receivers then respond with a pong to the multicast group so everybody else gets it. Um, so the way I implemented it for IPv6 this time is that I had GAP, GAP chat is actually joining both groups that are allocated by GAP, okay? And then GAP chat sending occurs when the user selects the address family on the, uh, on the um, command line. And if GAP chat sends a IPv6 ping and the guys that are responding um, only support IPv4 sending, they will respond to the ping with IPv4, but since all members are joined to both groups, they receive all the messages. So that's the simplest way to deal with the address family. You send to one address family that's selected and everybody will receive it because they join both groups. And yes, two trees are built in the network. Next. Okay, here will be an example that we're showing of a real, a real live example. Here we have um, three nodes that are running. Um, and if you, uh, I don't know if you can see very well. So the, this guy is being configured to run IPv4, which means he will only send IPv4 multicast packets. This guy will only send IPv6. And this guy is defaulting, which means he'll send IPv4. So the first event, go ahead, hit it. So what this guy is going to do is he's going to send something called hello from an IPv4 sender. That's going to be multicasted to two, these two guys. These two guys, all these three are uh, Docker containers on my lap laptop. So they have native multicast connectivity through the single do Docker thing. In the next presentation, it's gonna be over the internet. So it won't have native multicast. So basically the hello is multicasted. And since these two guys are joining the both groups, they get the IPv4 sender. Next. Now we have this guy sent, so he's gonna be sending Hello from an IPv6 sender. Of course, since they're joining the both groups, they receive it. Next. Now, this is a case where a ping message is being sent on the IPv4 sender, and we see that this receiver gets it and this receiver gets it. And then they receive that they respond back to a pong message, and we see the pong messages come back um, via IP uh, via IPv4. If you just look here, you can tell the difference between IPv6 and IPv4. Next. And now this is a ping that's being sent um, to IPv6. And this guy receives it and responds to V6. This guy receives it and responds to V6. And everybody receives the pongs. So that's the demo on how we have um, GapChat work for IPv6 multicast. Next steps. 
more testing, obviously. Um, we want to test multi-AF on an overlay with no data multicast exists in the underlay. The next presentation kind of does that, but we also want to implement a mix of, of native multicast and non-multicast islands, okay? Um, in the LISP working group, we have this draft called LISP group mappings where the overlay G and the underlay G originally mapped to the same value. But now we want to be able to have the overlay G map to a different underlay G. And we have a, a scheme where the edges can decide what the group is by using hashing or the provider can use it by using the mapping system. And so that draft explains all that. Um, the other thing is, is when you start up gap chat, the gap protocol runs and encrypts all messages. And it uses the, um, the name, that's the group name to encrypt messages. Well, we want to be able to, um, if somebody attacks the group, we want to be able to have everybody switch over to the key. And if we use Shamir's algorithm, it uses this MPC algorithm where there's a, a reverse Fourier transform where you can, a couple members could um, supply the part of the key and everybody else can restruct the full key without transmitting it over the network. Very powerful algorithm. So I'm gonna play with that to see if we can rekey the group for a multi-participant thing. Um, the lightweight RESTful APIs, if you don't wanna run gap in your application, you want it to run somewhere else, you can do that. I hesitate to do that because I don't want the implementation to be centralized. So I wanna keep it decentralized as much more. And then we're gonna write more apps to do different things. And of course, see more developers. Okay. So this presentation now is going to show you gap chat over IPv6 as well, but it's not going to be on Docker over native multicast. It's going to be on an overlay. And the overlay is the capital I internet. And what we decided to do is run it over Starlink um, satellites. We, sh we showed that at, we showed IP gap chat over IPv4 over LISP over, over satellite in San Francisco. Now we're going to show you for V6. Yep, that was that one. Yep. Why isn't it sharing? One second. Yeah. Let's do. Did you put a presentation in? Let's see. Oh, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> grab the screen again. Okay, so basically this demonstration is implementing RFC 8378, which is LISP um, over using the mapping system. And the mapping system allows you to tell you what the R locs that you replicate to. Should they be unicast R locs or multicast R locs? Okay, next. So you guys already know what gap is. We, we said that in the last presentation, you can go next. Okay, so a little, maybe a little bit more on gap chat. I should have maybe said this before, but it's a text-based multicast app that uses group addresses allocated by the gap protocol. And the way you would start it up on the command line is you type in gap chat, and then this is what you want to send packets in that address family. And basically the group name is the, actually the rendezvous point. In other words, all the participants that want to send and receive would use the same group name because that's what the gap Gap will hash on that value to pick a unique um, group address. And it tests the network, it claims the address, and it tries to resolve collisions. And we try to resolve collisions so we don't have collisions at the MAC layer either going through L2 switches. Nat, Nat, uh, Nate really wants that problem. <laughs> okay, so we're going to uh, demo it on a, a LISP overlay, and it's going to be an IPv6 multicast overlay on top of an IPv4 unicast underlay. Okay, because that's all we have in this scenario. Okay, next. Oh, I guess I should say that, um, could you go back? Yeah. It doesn't take too long. Okay. Now, what's important is, since we do all this stuff and we're using Starlink Wi-Fi routers, we have to go through NATs. So all this, all this stuff is going through NATs and we're doing NAT traversal at the same time logic in LISP to make this stuff work seamlessly. So this is, as soon as it comes up, so the orange um, is the overlay. In other words, these systems here, Dino node one, node two, node three, node four, um, are Docker containers and they are um, running on the overlay and they are connected to a Wi-Fi router that has the white links that are 
goes up to the satellite and eventually comes to the terrestrial network on the internet. Okay. Um, we have Dan Mack, which is in Arkansas. He's a physical Mac that he's attached to the Starlink uh, satellite as well. And then we have the map server, um, map server running in AWS, and the RTR is co-located with the map server, the same thing in AWS. And the reason we need that is because that's the anchor point for the NAT traversal. So what we are showing here is a packet full of hairpin. We'll go here and here to get through these two nets. Okay. Next IETF, I'm going to show you that we're going to use IPv6 unicast our loops underneath so we can go straight because we won't have the NAT problem. So that's what we're going to try to schedule for Brisbane. Next. OK. So these are four Docker containers, you know, node one, node two, node three, node four. And uh, just to show you on my laptop, I was connected to my Starlink router at my house. And we're going to, um, we're going to go ahead and send packets. And so let's, OK, so the first thing we do is Node one says, types in a text message, hi, I'm node one, okay, get next, this guy received it, and again, that guy received it, and that guy received it. And note, note they're coming in on IPv6 multicast addresses, FF1E, this is the A0 allocation range from the spec, um, and this is the hash value, okay. Next, now we want to send something from node two, Waiting for the delay, right? Oh. Oh, you're the delay. Oh, oh, was that it? It was that. That was it. Okay, yeah. I wasn't interested. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, right. So what's interesting here is this is the map cache in the RTR for sending packets, and you can see that for the IPv6 multicast group, you see the members of the group: no one, no two, no four, no three, and Dan's joined to the group running the application as well. Um, so this is the, the so where what we're doing here is we're doing head-end replication to these unicast addresses. What we're also going to try to do for next IETF is you'll see an underlay multicast address here. So this overlay multicast address will then um, replicate to an underlay multicast address that will have him or something else underneath. We got to figure out how to do that. Now, what's interesting about I wanted to single out this group, this 240-170-170. This is the actual group that GAP uses to send its claim messages. And you notice that all, all the nodes that are running the application are also joined via the, li the GAP library um, that are joined to be able to get claim messages. Of course, the application doesn't know this is going on, but since the packets have to go through the network, the RTR certainly knows what's going on. So you could, this is kind of a, a dual address family sort of situation that's going on. I don't have GAP working over IPv6, but that's just a simple matter of, of programming and trying to decide just like the application, should GAP run over both address families or one? And that's the sort of thing. Can we send double messages, those sort of things. So we're trying to make it a multi, a dual stack or, or multi-address <laughs> family application and protocol family so we don't have to do this twice. Do you want to add more chipping or not even go with that? Oh, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't want, so um, Mike is asking, we try to get this stuff working on a lot of our Macs. Um, we had IPv6 um, problems and Docker problems running on an M1 Mac because of, um, uh, okay, that's just operating system crap. You, you don't want to know about that. That's dirty laundry. But it, it's Apple and Docker not wanting to fix problems because they're pointing fingers at each other. So, 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 but the reason we should mention it is that we wanted, we wanted this stuff to run all on the Macs natively doing IPv6. And that's what we did uh, in last ITF. We had IPv4 running natively um, um, on, on Macs um, running M1. And it, it worked okay because we had to avoid Docker because of this, this problem. Um, but then when we did IPv6, we had IPv6 support problems on Mac OS. So we decided to go to Docker. So we couldn't get uh, Docker, IPv6, and Starlink all to work at the same time. And that's why we ended up doing this. That's what you wanted me to yeah. do. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, next. I think we're done. Think any, que it, yeah. any questions? Reactions? Complicated? Simple? Boring? No comments. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, great. We're right exactly on time, too. All right, Nate. 
your permit. There we go. So your uh, can you figure out how to request to present? I'm not sure how to. So is this? Uh, Sorry, my computer just went nuts. Um, Everybody see my screen? Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. So we talk about the zero configuration multicast address assignment. Um, Nate Carstens from Garmin and National Marine Electronics Association. First kind of an overview of the documents that we have. There's three documents. Uh, the first one is a problem statement. The second one uh, is looks at some of the, uh, the existing address allocation and um, kind of points out some of the areas that uh, will co cause conflict. So as a uh, result of that, we recommend that IANA creates a registry for dynamic multicast address assignment protocols, um, and then changes the group ID allocation for the MADCAP protocol, which is a centralized um, protocol that is currently taking up uh, the hex 80 through FF. Um, and assigning that to a smaller range in there. Um, also acknowledges the, the group ID range used by the, um, the IPv6 solicited node um, multicast addresses. Uh, and then I posted a new version recently. It just had some editorial changes um, suggested by, uh, I think, William Atwood. Um, and then the final one here is the, what we'll be discussing mostly today. Uh, and that's the ZeroConf MDNS-based solution. Um, this is primarily intended for Layer 2 networks, um, and it re reserves group IDs 900 through 9FFF from that, um, in that registry that was created in the second document there. Um, also want to thank everybody for their help in getting these uh, approved by the, or adopted by the working group. Um, just a little bit of update on, on OneNet. Um, this is the protocol that, or the specification or standard that um, we uh, are, are, are this, that's going to end up using this technology. Um, so in the last meeting that we had in September, I discussed the work that we um, have been doing with IETF and kind of laid out um, the strategy there. And uh, one that currently has reserved this range of addresses, um, 160 through 16F, uh, for use on our protocols, and we're we're using 160 right now, and the rest are kind of uh, unassigned. The uh, the idea here is that in in our standard, we will basically add support for a an altered version of this protocol that uses uh, 168 through 16F and dynamically assigns those using the same technique uh, as in the MDNS based one, um, but we'll do it in a way that won't conflict with the, uh, the, the draft that's out there. And the idea here is that we'll, um, we'll publish our standard with that, um, see how it works. And uh, when the IETF solution is published, we can just uh, kind of remove that or, or treat it as kind of a legacy section and encourage everybody to use the, uh, the published uh, version of the, the protocol there. Um, we also talked with somebody from IAB, and so they would like for us to give a presentation on OneNet and the, uh, our use of the IETF protocols uh, within that standard. Have a proof of concept. Um, the code is uh, posted out there in GitHub. Uh, and the form that this proof of concept takes is it's a command that will basically engage the MDNS responder to publish the records needed. Um, and, and scan for records that uh, make up the MDNS-based zero-conf uh, protocol here. So uh, it's, it's focused entirely on publishing the records. It doesn't do any uh, multicast uh, application communication. 
Um, it's just about reserving that, that group ID range. So the idea here is that you'll pass in um, a couple parameters here. You have the interface, which is what we need in order to get the IPv6 link local address. You have the, the application name, and that's described more in the, uh, the document, but essentially it's, it's a unique identifier that that's, makes up part of the, uh, the DNSSD record that you're publishing there. Um, you have the group ID, which is the group ID that, that you're reserving. Now, in actual practice, the way it's described in the document is that this would be um, this would be randomly generated and then saved in persistent storage. Uh, so the user, as part of this proof of concept, is expected to do that random generation um, and, and persistent storage aspect, or or not. You know, the demo is is more experimental, and so there's not it's not using random numbers just because it's easier. Uh, then there's an optional parameter here, the TTL, and that goes into uh, the, the the uh, MDNS record uh, time to live. Um, and that, that's optional, it defaults to an hour, but the demo will use, uh, I think, five seconds uh, primarily. Um, so this simulates advertising and collision detection. Um, and then we can use IP tables to simulate a partition and repair scenario where uh, part of the network um, is temporarily uh, unavailable and uh, to, to the other part. Uh, and then the repair where where we uh, we make it um, so they're again communicating with each other, and that's not primarily a concern with layer two networks. Um, however, there could be some scenarios where if you have like a VPN that uh, temporarily loses contact or something like that, um, that may come into play more with that type of scenario. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to. Uh, my demo here. Okay, this is the demo for the MDNS based zero comp solution. So we're going to run the program. Here. Turn up the volume, Nate. Using this group ID. We can see it finds the link local address of the interface, converts that into a link scope multicast address, and then into the multicast Ethernet address here. And then we see that it advertises that in Wireshark right here. Now, if we try to advertise the same address from the same device here, immediately it says that there's a local name collision. So that's fine. We'll go ahead and change that to group ID. Now the registration is successful. So both of those took place on the same device. Now we're going to go to another device here, and we'll try to advertise the same group as this uh, in the upper left. We can see that it encountered a, a collision and exited. So we'll change the group ID here. Um, actually, what, what's interesting here is we'll, we'll simulate a partition. Um, and this is where we'll, we'll use IP tables here to block all the NDNS traffic uh, between the two devices. And then we'll go ahead and advertise using this group address here. And then when we remove the block, simulating the partition repair, Bit. And we see that the uh, first device up here encountered a collision and is now exiting. Now let's repeat that, but we're going to change the TTL to something much larger, 3600. So I'm going to down here, 600. And we'll wait a little bit before we try to repair it. Okay, going to repair. It's much longer this time, but it does eventually repair. Okay, um, it, the, the time it takes to repair is somewhat dependent on the, the, the TTL, of course, but 
there's kind of two two aspects in play there. One is that um, the application is querying at a rate where it, when it's doing a continuous query, it, it will back off. Um, you know, it'll start with one second, go to two seconds, four seconds, eight, and so on. At the same time, it also will look at the TTL for the records and start querying it at, uh, or send a query at 80% of that TTL. So um, you have to understand the interplay between those two, but in general, the, the shorter the TTL, the faster it will repair, um, but also the more traffic is on the network there. So I think we, we would leave that up to uh, the, the people implementing the solution to figure out what the right balance there is between the, the uh, responsiveness to a partition uh, and the amount of network traffic that, that they can add as overhead. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Okay. Um, with the additional time, I wanted to throw out an idea here and just kind of get some feedback. Um, so what I, I want to call this the, the null and void pointer port. Um, so the idea here is the transport layer is, is used to multiplex the applications that are on the same host. So we see this with like, uh, HTTP and, and FTP, um, you would identify, identify those applications by the port number on the receiver. But with multicast, especially in this case, the application is really identified by the destination multicast address, which makes the port irrelevant. Um, but despite that, the current practice still requires developers to reserve a port with, with IANA, which can take a little bit of time and takes up more of the, uh, the port registry, um, perhaps unnecessarily. So the idea behind here is to reserve a port, um, in this case, 49151, which is the, the last user port, and call it the null and void port. Um, basically, the idea here is that a conformance stack would recognize use of this port um, and prevent applications from exclusively reserving that port. And at the same time, the conformant applications would not exclusively reserve the port. Um, an alternative name, if we don't like null and void, might just be the, the multicast application port. Uh, the idea behind null and void is basically saying uh, you, the use of UDP is, is essentially irrelevant um, within this, this particular application. It could just be an IP layer stuff, but the, the, all the socket APIs and, uh, that are needed on the hosts are all designed around uh, the use of UDP. Um, so what's cool is we can actually do this right now, and I've got a demo on that here as well. Um, the idea here is that um, I'll just use SOCAT here as part of the demo. And this, this has all of the, uh, the commands. And so you can go back and try this later at home. Um, but I've got two devices. Um, I've got one of our MFDs and, and a PC here. And the MFD is going to be multicasting data to the PC. And the PC, in this case, the receiver, it's, it's binding to the multicast address um, on that specific port. Um, and uh, the, there's no need to do like the, the set the reuse adder or, or reuse port socket address um, it, because it's just binding to the port here. So let me uh, pull up that demo as well. You got three minutes, Nate. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty quick one. Okay. Okay, this is the null and void port demo. I'll send a couple messages from uh, each of the transmitters alternating. that each message only goes to the intended receiver. And we also see this in Wireshark as well. OK. So I just wanted to open it up um, for comments on that, see if anybody was interested um, in that, pursuing that, being you know, participating in a draft or saying it's a good idea, it's a bad idea, uh, so on. Yeah, Tullus Eckert. So thanks, Nate. Um, the way I see it, it uh, this is competing with Dino's proposal for, for allocating addresses. Is that a correct statement? No, I, I mean, I say no. 
<laughs> okay, but the way I see it, uh, we seem to be wanting to, uh, you know, reuse address space from this Madcaps uh, space. And uh, both of these uh, approaches would want to use uh, part of that address space, right? So are we having two competing things for, for that address space so that we would have to further uh, subdivide when we adopt, when we want to move both of them forwards? Oh, so if you're, if you're asking about the multicast uh, address allocation, yep. um, what we look at it is more like there, there are two, two possible solutions out there that, and they each have their own uh, benefits and, and drawbacks. So they can well, coexist. That's, that's fine, but I, I call that competition. I don't care what it's called, just that uh, if I want to run both of them in the same network, they would need to have uh, separate address ranges. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. Really that's, that's what I mean with competing. So we're competing for the same address space. So we'll, we'll have to be careful in uh, that we are all happy with the size of the address space of splitting it up accordingly, right? We're not competing so, on the address space in just a different range. It's just um, the each allocation. Right, right, but I, th I, th I thought we're taking it all from the MADCAP uh, space that we're uh, uh, taking back. We're taking back this uh, this MADCAP space, and then we need to decide how to right, split right, it up. Right, so that address space will be divided into smaller chunks, right, like right, one exactly. for each. So, uh, yeah, and and, and I just just want to make sure that we all understand that we because, for example, I'm the one trying to say that we need to split up also between ASM and SSM, and then we have splitting up between this protocol and that protocol. Just so, as far as address management is concerned, we're all on the same page. And this yeah. is true for IP before Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm asking. Yeah. Um, six should always be larger, I, I, right? So. <laughs> well, I want to make sure it's yeah. done. Yeah. 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 I don't remember in IPv4 if there's any assign. Hmm. Yeah. I, don't know. I have to look at IPv4. Right. I know for V6 how it's done, but. Yeah. So then, basic comment on the way on how you're trying to kind of claim an address with. Um, MDNS. I think you're reinventing unnecessarily something that DNS SD already does. You don't need a new ETH adder dot ARPA. You're just, uh, you know, doing the, uh, you know, PIM WG, whatever the name is, as a service name. And uh, the Ethernet address is just the service instance name. So you can basically, by just doing that, simplify it and uh, say this is just how MDNS uh, DNS SD does it. Uh, what happens in DNS SD? Whoever wins has the actual Ethernet name, and the other guy gets Ether name in parentheses one, right? Because um, DNS SD tries to figure out. So that's the loser, right? So I'm, I'm just saying that people, you know, when this goes to to further review, and you you talk with Stuart Cheshire or other DNS folks, they'll basically point to the same thing and ask you why you're unnecessarily creating new. Um, you know, things that uh, DNS SD is already doing. So I, we can take it offline. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Charge Dave. Thank you, Nate. Thanks. Okay, thanks. So returning customer, I was here two years ago saying that we were trying to uh, look um, for larger, better scale um, things that we'd started uh, in beer. Um, then we went to beer and now we're back because we have some uh, new developments that uh, in conjunction with how the ITF works uh, has us uh, some question marks open. Next slide. That is way too much history uh, for your own. Next slide. So the... <laughs> <laughs> right, but hopefully it's a nice slide. So basically, the the um, the issue in large networks that we saw when we started this with global bit strings is that if uh, a beer bit string becomes very large, it's potentially expensive to process, and it's kind of non-intuitive to have, you know, four thousand bits, and you may only have. 10 interfaces to send out to, so why have to process them all? When we go to smaller bit strings, then that requires multiple bit strings in larger networks, so multiple packets. And we also need to do some good SDN controller allocation of them that they work well. And you know the degree of complexity isn't, isn't the point, but then we add BRTE to the mix, and that makes that whole problem even larger. Right, so one of the outcomes is even when the multicast trees are small, you only replicate to three receivers, you may end up having to send three packets. Next slide. So this is all wonderful with hopefully nice graphics explained here. There is also an M um, a presentation from um, my co-conspirator uh, Michael Ment and, and his team in the university looking at performance comparison, mostly for your own reading, right? So you have uh, three uh, bit strings to reach all the receivers, a red, 
a green and a blue one, if you just randomly distribute the bits from them in the network, you're ending up in number two with, you know, packets for every color across every link. Then you add the SDN controller, do nice allocation. Uh, things get better, you get more efficiently, then you do BRTE and it gets worse again. So uh, long story, just saying that we're here because of a perceived or real problem in large networks. Next slide. So what has the proposal been? The proposal has been, instead of using a single flat bit string, we're really encoding the whole tree, right? We're just telling the network exactly um, where the packet has to be replicated to, hop by hop or indirect hops. Um, and we started doing that all um, in, uh, in the beer working group with just with bit strings. And here we're getting to the points that we actually want to have bit string and sits. So on this slide, we're showing it very simply. You just look at this router Rx. Router Rx needs to replicate to two nodes, R2 and R4. So the only stuff that Router R2 should have to care about is not hundreds of bits, but just send it to R2 and to R4. Okay, fine. But then when it's being sent to R2 and R4, they also need to have their subtree do the same thing, which is why we're saying we have a recursive unit. And so as far as R2 is concerned, it only sees R2, then whatever blob there is for uh, R2 itself, the recursive unit, that's what it needs to copy over to the packet to R2. And once it gets to R2, well, it happens to be then, you know, another recursive unit, which just says you need to copy to R5 and R6, right? So can uh, go arbitrarily recursive. But in the end, the whole point is the only thing you need to parse and deal on is the list of neighbors you have. And for each neighbor, some blob that you need to copy in the packet to the neighbor. Next slide. So now that was with a list of neighbors. We call that SIT list because SIT is such a popular term in the IETF that we just had to reuse it. But of course, we can do the same thing with a local bit string where we're just pulling, you know, all the neighbors we want to set to together, create a local bit string. Router has 16 neighbors. We always have a 16 bit long bit string for the neighbor and we're just setting bits number R2 and R4 and, you know, all the recursive units come afterwards, right? So two very uh, simple alternatives, list of SITs or a local bit string. So what, which is better, right? Let's pick one. No, sorry, because it just one is more efficient than the other. The other is more efficient than the first, depending on the size of the tree, right? So I've given two examples here. You got to, you know, what was the first one? The angle here is really hard. Yeah. So we've got an edge route, 128 neighbors. The local bit string is 128 bits. So if the tree has less than 60 neighbors, a SIT list is better. If I need to replicate to more than 60 neighbors, the bit string is better. We go to a core router, number slightly uh, similar, right? So basically, it, it really depends on the tree what the most uh, ideal encoding is. And then one of the other things is if we have a global bit string, like uh, 16 or 24 bits, we can skip over, you know, a lot of hops and also create further, right? So very for very sparse trees, we use um, a, a longer global SIT of, let's say, 16 or 24 bits. So that's basically our current state of investigation just from the architecture of how we co uh, construct it. Next slide. So the current state of the hardware implementation, that's in the beer working group on Friday. So we haven't implemented all these things together, kind of started with the individual blocks, bit strings, SITs, and now trying to merge it all together, the draft here for the uh, PIM working group has kind of a first attempt of uh, trying to show how that could work in detail. Um, uh, but we, we think that this should uh, work fairly well across all, you know, the high speed platforms. Um, and, um, you know, the processing, uh, as far as what you need to look into, that doesn't scale with the size of the header, right? Just, you know, you need to copy out the RU. So there is, a, you know, on that creating the next packet, um, the copying effort. But so that was already when we were just doing bit string something where most vendors said that isn't the problem, but just, you know, long processing of a lot of data. And that's just for local stuff now. So that's, that, that's what makes it more scalable. Next slide. Okay, management complexity, because we have local identifiers, every router can um, allocate them themselves, announce into the IGP, as long as we just use local bit strings and local SITs, we don't need an SDN controller, right? We can build a fully distributed system. Every uh, sender just needs to know the topology, the local bits, and can construct a bit string. If the header is uh, a limit, it's also very easy for a sender to break up a large tree arbitrarily into smaller trees. We don't need to prepare for SIs or so, the kind of 
subdivide the network into uh, different sets of global bit strings, right? So we get rid of that management complexity. Um, global sets, of course, yeah. So everybody has a loopback address that's global. So hopefully that range is also not as, uh, an issue. Next slide. Okay, so when we already are doing crazy structures in a header, we can do further optimization because there are things that some old people are still using, TV, right? So if you have an IPTV application, then you may actually need to go to, let's say, 95% of all the 8,000 uh, endpoints in, and this is the uh, simulation that was done uh, for a Chinese network, um, you know, of all these, you know, hundreds of million people, I, I don't know how many subscribers are there, right? But so this slide, what that is showing is on the x-axis, it's the uh, percentage of multicast receivers from zero to 100%. On the y-axis, it's the number of packet replication. The green line is the number of packet replication used in beer. And the red line is the one with the uh, local bit string variant with which we started. And why is that number going down? Well, we do the trick that basically on the prior to last hop, we're saying replicate just, you know, one bit encoding that says replicate to all your leaf neighbors, right? So uh, that basically means you can compress very large trees on the leaves by saying, um, you know, broadcast to all your leaves. So that makes very large trees smaller again, and you need fewer copies for them. And I think that's basically where we are, right? We have a lot of small trees that sparse, and then we've got a really dense tree and we can also nicely traffic engineer them, steer them across path and broadcast to the whole edge. Next slide. Okay, so that was pretty much it. Where do we go from here? So we have uh, our ongoing prototyping work on P4. Um, as I said, uh, the draft here uh, shows uh, the possible encoding idea. So this is all based on extending, going back and forth on what we learned over the last two years working in the beer working group. The beer working group liked the idea with the local bit strings very much, but said they have no in interest in the uh, sit list. So, uh, which kind of means we may have an IETF problem, but given how we're not yet asking uh, for adoption, because we really would love to have the, you know, full, you know, what, what is the best thing we can do on P4, even if it's not relevant for us here as vendors, but we really would love for researchers to be able to work on that. And the only thing that a researcher can get high speed hand on is, is a Tofino switch, right? So that's, that's as, as far as it goes, right? So, and of course, this is not meant to displace or, or say bad things about beer and beer TE. I, I happen to be a, a big fan of that, but we really want to have, you know, these larger networks, less management complexity, better scale tree engineering, better forwarding uh, uh, scale uh, forwarding implementation, right? So just, you know, next generation to make it better. So, um, and hopefully, you know, by coming to PIM, we also go to a somewhat larger community. Who of you, was not going to, uh, to to the beer working group. Everybody? Uh, yeah, okay, one, two, okay. Right, so we, we got two more people, yay. <laughs> right, so, um, and if you have interest in this, yes, please uh, talk to us. So very happy to uh, expand the collaboration on this. Thank you. Thank you. Hongi. Hi, Matt. Speak up a little bit. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, hi. A little louder. Okay. Is it okay? It's pretty light, but just speak as loud as you can and go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. I'm Hongji from Ericsson. Uh, now let me introduce some updates about this uh, EVPN multicast uh, young model. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is version three. We 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 have got some comments and uh, make some updates. Uh, next, please. Uh, there are some minor updates. I will I will not list here. And this is this is a, uh, there is only one major update. Uh, this is uh, we add the uh, feature EVPN and IGMP policy and the uh, and the uh, feature uh, EVPN MLD po uh, MLD policy, uh, and the vendors could uh, uh, enable one feature or both of them. Uh, next, please. Uh, and this is a whole hierarchy about. Uh, about this uh, Yamado. 
Uh, uh, now let me uh, make some introduce about this. Uh, we uh, augment this EVPN, EVPN instance and add two leaves, uh, EVPN IGMP proxy and EVPN MLD proxy. Uh, if, uh, if EVPN, uh, if the leaf EVPN IGMP proxy is enabled, uh, it will trigger uh, IMAT root to update with the uh, multicast flags extended uh, community and uh, the IGMP proxy beta is, uh, is set, uh, similar as the UAPM MLD proxy. Uh, the, the second part is we, we augment the uh, routes under the UAPM instance and uh, as a uh, the RFC 9251, uh, the IGMP MLD policy for EVPN defines the three uh, new EVPN rules, uh, type 6 uh, to type 8. Uh, the, the selective multicast uh, Ethernet type route uh, is the uh, type 6, uh, type 6 route. Uh, the purpose is of this route is to distribute uh, the host uh, intent to receive the multicast traffic mm. and the multicast uh, membership report sync route is the type 7 route and the, the multicast leave sync route is the multi is the type is the type 8 route uh, they are used to optimize the multi exercise access uh, segment with root type uh, 7 and 8 uh, uh, next, please. Uh, we would like to apply for the working group uh, adoption here, and and we will welcome uh, we will welcome uh, more comments. Thank you. Okay, so um, I just started a poll. If you can respond to that, please, working group, uh, on whether you think that we should adopt this draft. This is a draft that would be more typically more appropriate in the best working group. We've pinged the best chairs and the and the best working group about this draft. They're a very busy uh, working group, and Hongji hasn't been able to get a response from them. So that's why he's presenting here, especially since we've progressed several of his other drafts, his other Yang drafts. And so we've been given permission to um, see if this is something that we do want to work on. If this is something that we do adopt, then um, we will once again ping the best chairs and get approval and go from there. So right now we have eight people that say yes, one person that says no, and 29 that have no opinion. So um, we will, that seems to be fairly strong consensus let's take it to list ask the chairs and um and thank you anji uh, thank you i think that'll do it all right yeah you're up no, come on all right so uh, this one that one okay We're doing okay. Yeah. Next. <clears throat> yeah. Good afternoon. And sorry, I don't have much text. So I have more of pictures. <laughs> yeah. So in this, this draft, we are talking about two things our integration of two different technologies. One is when we are deploying eVPN multi homing, and which we have, which we are seeing more and more providers, they want to have multi-homing in the access side with Alectu multi-homing. And multicast, there are still many customers or many deployments where they really don't want to touch PIM. PIM has been working for so many years, so let it work. So what is the problem if we go Alectu multi-homing? So if you see in this picture, right-hand side, I have uh, these uh, CE devices, which is that that's where your multicast source is connected. And receivers could be anywhere. It could be in the layer three network or it could be behind your uh, other, some different bridge domains. So left-hand side is the actual receivers. Today, how exactly PIM works? So 
when we try to reach any source which is behind these uh, multi homing segment so before even pim join when we look into our igp source reachability information my spines will see for any prefix that i have two next hops which is leaf 3 and leaf 4 and the reason is both of them are hosting same bridge domain and we are using evpn procedures to support this so overall ethernet segment based multi homing now your igp at spine or rest of the network says that you have uh, two next hop to reach the same source so when your actual join comes from the left hand side join will start looking into prefix how to reach the prefix so if we see here from the leaf 1 leaf 1 says that it has two next hop it can go via s1 or s2 our pim join reaches to s2 in the s2 again when i look at my source prefix it says that you have two next hop which could be ecmp i i take a local decision to go to leaf 3 when your actual source starts sending the traffic in the source when ce3 receives a traffic it is it is a port channel and when you have port channel with two member ports you are just going to pick one of the member port and it picks the right hand side so traffic reaches to leaf 4 so in this case we will never have traffic getting converged so receiver will never get the traffic and the reason is there are two places in the network where we are making a decision one is in the ce device which is making decision about which upstream i am planning to send traffic on and there is a one decision which is happening at spine which is about how where to where to send my join to and these two guys they are not talking to each other and that is where we can run into this situation next slide question okay so how are we handling it today the way we handle it today and most of uh, best working group which is defining evpn procedure is it has defined a layer 2 tunnel which is evpn based tunnel where we send our traffic over bump tunnel to other peer so in this case whichever whatever traffic is coming on l4 for a given bridge domain we send everything to layer th l3 as well which is leaf 3 in this case now if you look at from the pim perspective it is kind of a lan case where both of the router have the 100% of the traffic it doesn't matter who is getting the join you will receive the traffic next so theoretically it works very well it has been working for couple of years now but the challenge is if you see that we are using those band link twice so we are sending a traffic to via spine to other peer and then again it goes back on the same link to serve the layer 3 network now these doubling the traffic sometime depending on the kind of use cases you have or the kind of uh, flows ba bandwidth of the flow it may not be really uh, necessary that you are using your network optimally so there are deployments where they want to see that how can we optimally use our multicast network next so here uh, when when we are talking about pim network so we have an experimental rfc which has been uh, implemented as well which is pfmsd so this provides an infrastructure where you can really flood some information in whole pim domain and that is what we are planning to use to make sure these two uh, decision makers they somehow come in sync so that both of them are really making the same uh, same decision or similar decision we can go to the next so what 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 exactly is needed in this case i want s2 to know where exactly my traffic is rather than looking into prefix based forwarding i want to really know where this sg is present and if i know that that information well in advance or at least when the actual source is active then i can really drive my join towards wherever the source is next so what we are going to do the this is the first step or i would say brute force method where when system is booting up or your whole network comes up there is no traffic traffic has not been started yet you don't have really control whether source will come first or receiver will come first so let's say that receiver comes first so if receiver comes first it is going to send join as it was sending earlier right now there is no information at all anywhere so join may really come to leaf 3 even in this case but eventually leaf 4 will receive the traffic and that is where we would like to when we see and leaf 
really understands that the interface where I am receiving the traffic is multi-home, all active multi-home uh, net interface. So if I am receiving any multicast traffic on all active multi-homing port, I am going to start the flooding the information. Now, originally PFMSD or the source of flood mechanism was for ASM only. In this case, we will have to do for both. Any traffic which is coming on these multi-homing ports will be flooded and this information reaches to S2 as well. Now that is where S2 can do its RPF change or if your source came first, the join will really take the appropriate path. So in this case, Leaf4 sends a message, use, uses the same infrastructure of PFMSD where it is going to flood the S, G reachability information that where this source is active. And S2 is going to make the call that I have to send or direct my join to Leaf4. Next. So, okay, I think we already spoke this as well. So can you go to previous slide? Very, as I said, the brute force method, when you start flooding, this information is not going to be limited only to S2. It is going to be flooded to the whole domain. So in the next revision, what we are trying to come up with, that how to control it dynamically where your, these flood information is going only till spines. It really doesn't go to the whole network. And when I say spine in this picture, it, it means that the nearest replication point where you come into the situation where you will have ECMP path. So we should be able to stop flooding right there so that we still use flood mechanism, but we flood it in the control environment. And that is the next step optimization we are planning to work on. Next. And any comment, question? Thomas Eckert, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I, I, I get through all of it, but do I see it correctly that this EDPM is doing some crap that does multicast not work and we have to fix it on top of them? Uh, it is not like that. So okay. EVPN is, so till now we were, most of the time we were doing multi-homing with active and standby. So we were good. Now this is new concept, which is getting traction or many people are deploying that, which is all active multi-homing. Okay. When you do all active multi-homing, both of both sides are advertising the same prefixes. That same prefix can reach using both of the PE or VTEPs. Now that is, that is definitely going to impact multicast. For unicast, it doesn't matter because you can come either side and you can still communicate to your host. But multicast comes in reverse direction, so we have to do something about it. I mean, nothing against the ingenious uh, hex that this, this, this may actually work, but why shouldn't the EVPN folks first try to fix it on their side? when they do something new. So e, there is nothing which EVPN can do here. So the decision which port channel is making, that is like LSEP. So LSEP picking one of the neck, uh, one of the upstream interface, that, that is, you cannot do it. You don't have any control over it. But that's part of, of, of how EVPN is defined, right? They're, 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 they're using that mechanism. So there are, there are two decisions maker. One is, the traffic which is coming from southbound to northbound, how are you going to make sure, how can EVPN even make a Let, call? Let's have an offline talk. It's just sure. it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it sounds strange. Sure. Uh, Sunny Zhang ZTE, um, I'm wondering that if it cannot only be used by EVPN multi-homing, because if we use some L3 multicast source to send the information through two uplinks, then the situation is the same. So um, I think maybe the situation should be uh, extended to all the information that can be included. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's all. Uh, Rurik, I saw you in the queue. Did you want to say anything or please go ahead if you have any comments? Uh, Rurik, yeah. Um, okay, I guess we will move on. If you have any comments, you can take them to the list. Okay. All right, so one more EVPN, next. 
okay so what what exactly we are going to cover in today's session it is what is happening with evpn and what kind of requirement it brings for pim domain when it is getting connected with evpn fabric and this work belongs to bess why pim so before we go to bess we want to make sure that it really covers all the aspect of pim and that's that's the reason we wanted to first discuss this in pim before taking this to bess most of the procedure change belongs to bess where we will have to do procedure changes in the evpn signaling for uh, dgp for evpn so it just talks about the use case that what exactly is the use case or where these two term, uh, uh, these two technologies talk to each other so let's have just a quick recap that when we say pim pim is a, by default it is soft state protocol and majority of the packets we keep sending the refresh but the most of most of the time which is our most prominent packets which are being used is hellos join and prune so this is with respect to pim what happened in case of evpn so in evpn all the service, services over evpn is a services over bgp so we have a hard state protocol where we don't send same information multiple times and there is one important aspect to understand which, which is the df election here the reason why uh, we we really need to be careful about df is with df it it really defines a mechanism that who is going to send traffic to the south south of the pe devices so in this case your leaf 3 and leaf 4 are multi homed with all active multi homing for any multicast traffic so not just for multicast it is for the whole bum so for bum traffic there will be only one of the guy who will be forwarding at any given point of time not both of them so this is the kind of evpn requirement so we have protocol which is pim where which is the soft state protocol then we have evpn which is hard state and some of the new procedures it brings which is all active multi homing so what we are going to discuss what will happen if you have a evpn fabric when i say evpn fabric it which means that i am really extending my layer 2 network or layer 2 circuits over uh, your mpls core or any layer 3 core and within these uh, individual layer to domains there is already a routing domain and if we map this to real use cases you can have a service provider which is providing services to small enterprises and these enterprises may have purchased just layer to circuits uh, with the service providers now these small enterprises they are running their own pim even though they have uh, they have layer to circuits they have presence across the country or maybe worldwide but internally they have their own pim domain so now that is where the intersection comes together where you have a pim network then your between two pim domain you have evpn network as well which is connecting these two pim domain next so this is uh, bringing the high level requirement that what what kind of requirement we are trying to solve first thing is these uh, reducing the pim soft messages so be it hello be it join prune these messages are being sent continuously if we are going over evpn fabric we want to reduce those uh, messages and then the initial focus is on pim hello and join prune but nothing prevents us to really extend this solution for all other uh, use cases and the next is whatever solution we are doing it must still provide a optimal way to provide multicast services and then prevent multicast duplication where you have same traffic going twice and it should be supporting multi homing and multi homing with orphan links yes stick so you talk about avoiding soft state and periodic messaging yeah so i'm wondering if you could use pim port for the join prints and do you really need the hellos or can we do something like pim lite for some somehow avoid them Yeah, so I think that's the reason why we first want to just discuss the problem space, and then we can decide whether we want to convert it to BGP state or we want to really go with something else to support these cases. Next. So first thing is uh, when we talk about 
PIM hello and join prone. So in this picture, I have three PIM routers, R1, R2, and R3. These, these are three different PIM domains, but are getting connected using EVPIN fabric. So today, the way default behavior, uh, the way it works by default is R1 is going to send a hello. And if we flood these hellos, these hellos will be received by R2 and R3. And these hellos will be getting refreshed every 30 seconds or whatever timer has been configured. So these are the packets which will keep going over the core. That is number one. The second is join prune. If we build any tree between these two domains, these uh, join prune messages will keep going and they have to cross these uh, core network via. So right now it will be kind of a flood where every 30 seconds we are sending our joins next. Then the second problem statement is that is the one of the flood prevention where all the soft state messages we want to prevent. The second part is if you have a PIM join, if PIM join is being sent from R3, this PIM join can go to either of the leaf and nothing prevents it to go to leaf four. If join reaches to leaf four, leaf four can build all the tree necessary tree and get the traffic. The decision of whether leaf four being able to forward traffic towards this PIM domain depends on the DF state. And if it is a non DF, it is going to drop all the traffic. So we have to have a way where we can support these kind of uh, use cases where irrespective of your DF state, we should be able to serve PIM domain next. The solution overview is that currently this draft, we are resurrecting this from, I think, IET of 97 or so. So the initial initial solution, which we had thought was converting PIM hellos to BGP based signaling, where you get a hello and you kind of act as a gateway in the EVPN land and you just send it using BGP and let individual uh, EVPN gateway take care of proxying on behalf of remote guys that that is the base solution but definitely we can uh, discuss if we want to go ahead with pim light or something else the second one is join prune proxy procedures it is again same thing where we are converting similar to hello where uh, we convert it to bgp based signaling and then having some assert optimization for the multi homing we already have rfc which which defines procedure for multicast sync and those are the routes can be reused even for PIM. And the next point is how exactly your IGMP host and source are going to talk if source, these two are sitting in the same bridge domain or they are sitting in different bridge domain. Next. So these are the use cases which we would like to discuss and yes, any input or uh, feedback is welcome. Okay. I, I can see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Huai Mo from Futureway. Uh, today I'm going to talk, talk about uh, adaptive stateless uh, TE multicast. Next page. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Jeff and uh, Tolos for their comments. Uh, we made some updates. So the updates to previous version include adding simplified version of multi adaptive TE multicast and uh, some comparisons. Next page. In general, a multicast tree is big and sporadic in some networks. For example, in this picture, and a multicast tree, this multicast tree, so on, on node P1, so we have number of links. So on the one end, we have a link to from P1 to P2 and P3. And then in the other end, we have a number of links the links from P1 to P8 and then P9 and to P19. So if we use a single, any single encoding method, and then the efficiency is, uh, is not good. So here, 
in the full version of adaptive T multicast. For each portion of a tree, we select a most efficient method among the multiple encoding methods. So here in this example, so we use a, for, the, for the link from P1 to P3 and P2, we use a link number, which is cycled by the, by the, pin, by the pin in the, in, in the, in the, in, in the pin, pink cycle. So for the link from P1 to PE8, PE9, and PE19, we use another encoding method. Here, we use a flexible bit string. So this is a, is a cycle in yellow color. So in this way, we can encode any part of a tree using a most efficient encoding method. So in general, we can get an optimum encodings for any tree. So that's the full version of adaptive TE multicast. Uh, some people said, um, comments that this may be uh, complicated. So in order to address that comments, we propose a simplified version. So in simplified version, we just select two methods. So we use two methods to include any portion of the tree. That means that for any portion of the tree, we just select a more efficient method from those tools. So in the bottom of the picture, we can show that we only have two colors of cycles. So one color indicate one encoding method. So for the pink cycle, we use link number, and then for the yellow cycle, we use a flexible bit, bit string. So this way, we simplified uh, the method, but we can also achieve maybe a very good results. Next page. Can you define encoding model or method? And what, what do you mean in encoding model? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> You're making a reference to an encoded method. What does that mean? Oh, those ones we were talking in the in the draft. What's the flexible encoding? What's the uh, link number encoding? And what's the half flex encoding? Those are details already in the in draft because we already present this one in the pre. Uh, thing. Know, so. Yeah, 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 we already described those in details. <laughs> so here we just. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the <laughs> that depends. People always have time or interest to read the draft. That, that depends on them. So here you see we give a encoding simplified simple version because we only use two methods. So we just use a, a flag, one bit flag. So zero maybe indicate one one method and one indicate another method. So so from encoding point of view, even we have select two method encoding any part of the tree, and then encoding is also relatively simple. So next page. So we make uh, some comparisons. So we compare this simplified version with any single encoding. So here, just the, for example, multicast tree, we, if we use a simplified version, we use a 20, 23 bytes. If we use any other single encoding, for example, half flex bit string, we'll use a 35 bytes. Flexible bit string, we'll use a 33, and then link number will use a 38, and then any other method will be will be consume much more bytes. So, from percentage of view, we can see that half flex bit string will use more than 32, uh, 52 percent, and then for flexible bit string, will more more than 43, and the link number 65 percent. So we can see that simplified version is much more efficient than any single encoding. But a single encoding may be a little bit simpler. And then that's uh, the comparison between the simplified version and the single encoding method. And then we also compare the simplified version with the full version. So simplified version maybe uh, is a simpler, but the full version I think is more extensible because if someone come up with a very efficient single encoding and then we can just uh, just uh, plug in to the, this uh, full version. Also in general, the full version will be optimal 
so that's a, a, a and then however the the simplified version is a very close to the to the full version from the efficiency for you yeah next page yeah any comments are welcome Thomas Eckert, yeah, would, would, would be nice to see hardware implementation of that, right? So it's uh, getting uh, somewhat similar to what we're proposing for the same purpose, right? So the uh, simpler and faster we can get it, uh, the better. Yeah, I know your message is similar, yeah. Uh, you also combine the different ways, and then in that way, we can achieve an optimum encoding. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is, this is all something which, which would really be good to have a P4 implementation for, for reference, right? So or else uh, some other vendor high-speed implementation, but then, uh, you know, how can researchers use it, right? So. Yeah, I think this is also a very good research, research topic. For example, this is a different combinations, and then we can get simulations and then get some proposals. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Luis Contreras from Telefonica and I will present a work together with uh, Itoshi Asaeda from NICT in Japan. So this draft uh, uh, describes a signal-based mechanism for supporting multiple string interfaces in IGMP MMD proxies. Next, please. So this work is, is uh, somehow framed uh, in, in the case described in the, in the draft that uh, you can see the title the, the reference in the title, so the Rafa Saida PIM multi IUM MP MLD proxy. So there we are uh, somehow proposing a, an extension of the current specification of the uh, IEMP MLD proxies in order to support more than one upstream interface. So the current specification is that the yeah, only one uh, upstream interface could be supported. So there we argue the, 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 the use cases that support the, this proposal, and also we uh, address different uh, aspects. One aspect is the, the static upstream interface selection that could be based either in the, in the channel or the subscriber or, the pri or based in a kind of priority. And then we talk about uh, two specific uh, mechanisms or selection mechanisms that are uh, different from the static one, that would be pure configuration. One of them is about automatic upstream interface selection, so involving some signaling. And for that, the proposal is to leverage the, the extension of uh, mechanism defined in RFC 9279. So this is the scope of this draft, what I recommend right now. And then there is a, a, another um, option that could be a controller-based upstream selection. And this is a work in progress and we expect to present in next ITF. So we will concentrate on the on the signal for uh, this automatic upstream interface selection. Next, please. So there are two aspects to consider in uh, at the time of selecting the interface. One is the policies defined in the proxy for selecting the upstream interfaces. This could be ba based on, on a particular uh, user identifier, so the source IP could be the case, or either the source or either the group. The, these uh, um, policies would be common to any uh, mechanism, so these are not particular. Uh, I mean, it could be applicable for the controller-based uh, or even for the, for, well, I'm sure for the static. But um, what we want to concentrate is in signal situations uh, that would be somehow what we try to, to um, uh, propose in, in this document. And the signal situations that we do for C is uh, one for the retrieval of the multicast channel or, or source, perhaps an interface, so getting from the, uh, from the proxy what, what is uh, the, 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 the channel or source state. Uh, state. Then the multicast channel or source request from one or more upstream interfaces, so to, um, to get knowledge of what are the, the channels of sources uh, coming from each of the, uh, multi, all the upstream interfaces. And then the third case would be the, the maintenance of the multicast membership information in the downstream, so the, that we can uh, be sure that uh, the, there are subscribers subscribe to the different channels and, and who is, uh, let's say, taking if, um, if channel at the end. Um, and, and these are particular uh, methods that can be defined, or we understand can be defined through the extensions uh, following uh, RSC 9279. Next, please. 
So the, the changes from version 00, we have uh, refined the terminology. We were using discovery uh, in, in, in 00 version, and uh, we realized that it could be confusing. So we are substituting that by information retrieval. And we are, well, this is editorial work fixing uh, in text and figures. And also we, have, uh, we added a, a number of figures showing the signaling uh, work, uh, workflows and flows so that the, the, the usage of the messages becomes, uh, we expect that to be more, much more clear. So these are the figures that have been inserted in the draft. This has been the, essentially the changes for this version. Next, please. So here we present uh, basically the, the roadmap that we uh, want to propose to the working group for the, for the work in the area of supporting multiple ASCII interfaces. We have, as uh, mentioned before, the draft as that that is somehow a, a kind of framework for this uh, proposal of supporting multiple ASCII interfaces. So we would like to ask for adoption of this, uh, of this draft um, because, it's, as I said, it's a kind of framework that opens the door to different uh, solutions. Then for the, the data that I presented today, the draft Contreras, PIM, Multif, Config. So there are some pendings to do. One is to extend the content to IGMP. We are right now focusing only on MLD. And then also to include the um, text for the include or exclude modes uh, in the stations of the report message. This is not yet done, so we need to, to cover that in, in version 02. And then also we are working uh, in the draft that I got commented also before for the um, uh, uh, automation of the configuration via uh, an SDN controller. We want to propose a jump model for that, and, and that will be the, the third draft that we will present in, in this context. So uh, summarizing, this is the, the work we are doing. This is the roadmap that we would like to follow. Um, we will ask the chairs in some point in time, the working group adoption, if they consider it's uh, relevant for the working group to work on, on this for the framework that one. And yeah, and comments and, and or suggestions are more than welcome as, as always. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. So the Hitoshi draft, then um, you are you, either now or eventually you'll be seeking for a working group adoption? Yes. Do you want to talk about it later or do you want, do you want us to? Well, well <clears throat> sorry. We didn't prepare a, a, a specific presentation for, for today, but this has been presented several times in, in the yeah, PIN yeah. working group. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we can take this in, into the list so the people has time to, to read and that's a good idea. Uh, and take an informed decision. Is the draft updated? Is it uh, It has been uh, updated just simply for referencing the second draft. No, okay. no, not updated from the point of view of content, just uh, simple references. OK, update it, bring it to the list, and then we will eventually ask for working group adoption. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, well, I guess we are done. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. Yep, thanks. What's the date for the work group to come? Yeah. What's he saying? <coughs> no, I said something about late to lazy to say it's closed. We don't do anything uh, <laughs> conventional. Yeah. yeah, in reality, I guess we have a one more presentation, but it's yeah, we got good, uh, but it's, it's kind of amazing that everyone's stuck to their yeah, yeah, yeah. Still happy. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Long time to see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, the MOR uh, TRV draft. Uh, uh, we we call us uh, have an uh, update, uh, and we think uh, uh, it's uh, stable now. And uh, we, we want to ask for the one group last call. Is that perfect? Yeah, I'm on hard. Yeah, I was wondering slightly whether it's good to have a new presentation, but I guess not. Have we done this? Is I think what you're asking.
No, I don't know. No. Uh, in in the uh, uh, March in 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 the this year uh, in the March. Yeah, I think it was in the October two weeks ago, back in the spring. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, have you made any changes? Or, yeah, how big are the changes since your last presentation? Do you spoke to present about what you have done, what you changed, or uh, some uh, some uh, some uh, the, the changes are uh, uh, more about the the uh, edit editor change. Yeah. Okay, it's very minimal. No, I think it will be a loss. Uh, I guess I'm gonna maybe, yeah, maybe read through it again myself too. Thanks, Mike. We'll talk to you later. Uh, comments first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So yeah, I mean, from what I remember, it's in good shape, but maybe I want to read it one more time more yeah. carefully. Yeah. But if I only have minor comments, that can be part of the last couple of comments. So. But I know we, uh, we, we often have problem getting people to read the documents. <laughs> so hopefully, if we are last call, we will get maybe some more input. So, uh, you know, we will get more people to look at it.